And Afghanistan. And just briefly, for the last 17 years, Oni has given her time to the Afghan women's organisation based in Afghanistan and refugee camps in Pakistan, and is currently convener of Women's International Solidarity Australia, the Melbourne-based support group for those women. Um, the presentation today is, is telling her uh, of her stories of some of these people, the life for women and, and men too. Um, has been bleak and few opportunities that we take for granted, education, health, care, and, and etc. Um, but these feisty people, very feisty people, uh, are not daunted and are determined the future will be better as they demand and strive for change. Those who have seen Oni, um, Oni has become recommended from other Provost clubs, have, have told me the talk is, is not what you expect. <laughs> no, I don't know what to expect, but it's not that. <laughs> so, well, please welcome Oni Wilson. Thank you very much, Jeff, and thank you very much for the invitation. And I can uh, assure you I won't be singing or dancing. <laughs> that's, that's what's happening. Yes. Um, I go back quite a long way uh, with Afghanistan. Um, this goes back, my interest in Afghanistan goes back to in the early 70s when um, I was a teacher, I trained as a teacher and then was particularly distressed by the fact that we had to work for three years on a contract before we could head off and explore the world. I mean, these days, um, how, how lucky were we? These days, a three-year contract is, is quite you know, unbelievable. But there we were. We talked for three years and headed off for a, a, an adventure overseas. We were completely naive. We knew nothing about the, the world outside of probably our own suburb, but we certainly learnt a lot. And one part of it was a whole year's trip um, of coming from Scotland through to Nepal. And it was in a Morris Minor ex-post office van that we bought sight unseen for £10. And it was particularly attractive. It was red on the inside and somebody had painted it a pale blue with house paint on the outside. So it, was, it looked particularly good. And you know how small they are. They're very small. But that was our mobile house um, for a girlfriend and myself. And off we went on this uh, one-year adventure. And uh, people had said to us, um, you know, when you actually get to Afghanistan, that will be the end of you. So once you cross the border, you'll find that bandits come out of the hills and with, uh, you'll be dead. They'll have uh, guns and you won't get any further. So we were absolutely terrified that this was going to happen. Um, we were the only girls that we sort of found that were travelling this way. We did meet two other girls who were together on, a, on public transport, but we were quite unusual. Uh, but two girls driving our own ex-post office van uh, across this area. But once we got into Afghanistan, we were very impressed. We'd been harassed in lots of places, but nothing happened in Afghanistan. Uh, we were particularly impressed by the scenery, and this photo really uh, has part of the feel of, of, of what we were seeing. Uh, wide open space is a bit similar to what we find in Central Australia, but uh, quite different colours, mushrooms and, and uh, creamy colours, um, and mountains uh, in, in the background as well, not necessarily uh, completely desert and flat. But we also found that the people were, were very hospitable. We didn't get harassed, we were actually welcomed. And we were quite surprised. And of all the places that we've been to in the four years, and there were many, we have got many tales of, of travel, uh, Afghanistan stood out as being particularly significant. So once we were back here in Australia, um, I kept a bit of an ear to, to what was happening in Af Afghanistan. Not much was heard, but we, uh, we did hear something. But um, it wasn't until the Taliban uh, came into office that we started hearing about what was happening to women. And we had uh, a number of us have been working with, uh, and connecting with other women in different countries to support them uh, in working for women's rights and, and uh, women's situation. So I said to a friend, um, there must be, must be some women we can connect with in, in Afghanistan. And it, was, it was probably about 1999 and we'd, I'd only just started using the internet and I came across this particular group, um, RAWA, the Revolutionary Association of the Women of Afghanistan. Um, but their revolution was about educating women and girls. It was not about bombs and guns. So we connected with them and we had them come out here. Um, 
for, uh, I think we've organised about eight, eight different visits of them coming up to talk about their circumstances and to have their, their story told. And usually I'm not a speaker, I'm usually the administrator behind the scenes and it's the Afghan woman uh, that we've invited who does the talking. But they're not here at the moment and so what I'll tell you is their story. So what, what I'll tell you is not what you hear in the news and hopefully I guess at the end of this there's a couple of things that should come out of it. One, that there's more to any story that you read in a newspaper and the second, we live in the best place on the planet. And certainly we are extremely fortunate. We probably, most of us wouldn't have sat any test to get here. We landed here and we've really hit the jackpot because if we landed in Afghanistan, we might be in a quite different situation, that's for sure. And <clears throat> but what has happened in Afghanistan, unfortunately for Afghans, um, is their location. And it's a country which is landlocked. Now for us, we're very fortunate. We, we have a border, a moat, all the, <clears throat> all the way around the country. And we, we, we get particularly anxious when uh, a few people are coming from the north uh, on boats, but we don't have people around the borders who are trying to get from one side to the other or to get in to take over something or other. The only ones who probably are worried about are those New Zealanders um, they're heading across. <laughs> I think we've had an invasion of them already. So, but certainly for Afghans, the location of the country has been a, a problem for them, um, an unfortunate problem. So you can see by the map here that Afghanistan has borders with across the north, um, the three Soviet, former Soviet states. Press the button in the middle. In the middle? Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. You're all well equipped here. <laughs> okay, so across the top, we've got the three uh, former Soviet states. You've got um, Tajikistan, uh, Uzbekistan, and Turkmenistan. You've got a large border with Iran, a large border with Pakistan, and then a tiny border here with China. So it's, it's a landlocked country, and those countries around about are particularly interested in what happens there and, how, and the influence that they can have. But not only are those countries interested, it's countries further afield which also have some interest, like Saudi Arabia, Israel, US, uh, UK, etc. It really, its location is a, a crossing point in, in, in uh, Central Asia, and so uh, there is a lot of uh, con um, interest in having influence. India is another one as well. And I'll just explain in maybe the last 40 years round right about what's happened politically, because the circumstances in the country are really uh, a consequence of what has been going on. And when we were in Afghanistan, it was 1972, uh, the, the central authority figure was a king, uh, and he was a particularly progressive fellow. His wife also was very progressive, and they were talking about, just as we were starting to talk about here, of, of equal rights for, for women and girls. Um, there was a coup in the country, it was a group who then overthrew the king, and this was a group which had uh, links to the USSR, um, they then started having influence, uh, political influence in the country. <coughs> they were, were having uh, direct contact regularly with, with the USSR and they had asked troops to come into the country to support them because there was a lot, quite a deal of opposition amongst other Afghans that they didn't particularly want this group to be in government. And this was the time of the Cold War, so the US was particularly interested in what the USSR was doing. So it was under Jimmy Carter in 1979 that a plan was thought that perhaps it would be a, a very strategic opportunity to engage the USSR in Afghanistan in ongoing conflict to weaken them. And um, so the plan was set up and there were, was $4 billion over 17 years put into the country to arm local uh, war, local leaders um, to engage in this uh, contact. And uh, once the contact had started, troops from the USSR, USSR were drawn into the country and, and a 10 year period of, of fighting um, happened. Now, the Afghanistan itself is made up of different ethnic groups, so there is, at that stage, the authority figure really was not the centralised control, 
but local control. So you've got different ethnic groups like Pashtuns, which is actually where the Taliban come from, Uzbek, Tajik, Hazaras. Hazaras are the ones who we will have here. They're the lowest on the picking order and they're the ones who are persecuted regularly by the Taliban, which is the largest group. And so they, they flee um, um, because of, of uh, the fact that they're about to be killed um, and they have quite a lot of problems uh, in Afghanistan. And so the US uh, decided this uh, by going to local leaders who had the authority and giving them a lot of money and arms that they then would be encouraged as a Mujahideen force to fight against the USSR. So as I said, this went on for 10 years. There was one, uh, one million that were killed, Afghans, not US troops, Af not US uh, people of any description, but Afghans. And about a third of the country fled. Something like four, four million went to Pakistan and about another three million <coughs> fled to, to Iran. Um, again, we, we have very few people coming, fleeing uh, and arriving here in Australia, but poorer countries like Pakistan and Iran uh, had to deal with those large numbers. And um, during the, that, that period was 70, uh, 79 to 89, and there was a plan put forward from Pakistan, from the ISI, that's the, the secret service, to get together a Mujahideen, a, fun, a fundamentalist religious group, to fight against uh, these troops. So it was um, under the CIA with uh, William Casey, um, and there was worldwide uh, uh, recruitment of getting this group together. Um, Bin Laden was uh, part of, of this um, uh, plan. He, he uh, brought money into to having this training happen, and it happened in Pakistan. So the US and Bin Laden were very good friends and uh, it was all uh, going along very nicely. Um, Saudi Arabia was involved in supporting um, financially uh, Pakistan, Iran, Israel was very active in providing armaments. Um, uh, the, the US and the, the Israel armament industry um, boomed at uh, this time by providing the, this armament for the group. And so it was successful. In 1979, the USSR troops were, um, were, were defeated. And so after a 10 year period, um, you can imagine what happens. You've had people who you've trained militarily who now have, were well, very well armed, have quite a bit of money and they're looking for something to do with it. They're not gonna go home and knit. They want to go and find, find uh, you know, something else to do, which means that their internal fighting started. And in, in 1992, the group from the North, the Northern Alliance, which you might have heard of, they were the ones that took control of the country. And they were a particularly aggressive and violent uh, group. Uh, we hear a lot about the Taliban and how violent and aggressive they are, but the, the Northern Alliance were equally bad. I think in the first six months of them going into uh, Kabul, they 50,000 people were killed, slaughtered. Um, the next group to, to then challenge them was the Taliban. So that was 1996, they, they took control of the country um, and then uh, that was the group that were, were established when September 11 happened. And if I go to the next slide. Uh, what we normally hear, we hear, do we do hear about the, um, the first thing that the USSR, so I'm looking up, up here at the, um, here, the top part, the black, Bits are really what we hear about. So when we see we've got war with, with uh, USSR, Northern Alliance coming in and the Taliban coming in, and then the next thing we really hear about, a terrible Taliban and September 11, um, and uh, the US is con particularly concerned about Taliban, so there's an invasion of Afghanistan uh, October 7th, and that's with, other, with NATO forces and other countries joining in with this. The next bit we hear about is that then there's a new president who's put in, Hamid Karzai, um, and he then oversees writing a constitution and having a two-tiered form of government similar to what we have here. And the next bit we hear, down in 2014, Ashraf Ghani becomes the new president. Um, similar to, to the US two-term president, so once Hamid Karzai had, had his two terms, then there was a re-election, but these were democratic elections. 
So that's pretty much what gets put into the into our papers. But we have to have a look and see what else has been going on there. So it isn't just by accident that things are happening. Is there's meddling going on? So. Uh, certainly, uh, during the period when we've we've, uh, we've had uh, the U.S. wanting to get effect on the U.S. Uh, the USSR troops, um, and the Northern Alliance had come in at that particular time, um, there was an, an Argentinian fellow, um, Carlos Bacaroni, with his oil company Bridas, and he had approached the Northern Alliance, uh, Rabani, who was, who was heading it at the time, uh, with a plan to bring oil from the north of Afghanistan through, uh, from the Caspian Sea area, which was rich in oil, through Afghanistan and out through Pakistan. So he negotiated with them, with, the, with his company, and an agreement was formed. So it was a 30-year agreement, um, and the, the pipeline, well, the oil and gas pipeline was going to be built. But once the Taliban came in, that was really the end of the negotiation. It had to start again. And uh, Mubukarani had uh, approached Unical, the American oil um, uh, uh, company, to be part of a consortium. But Unical had said they were not interested because they actually wanted this for themselves. So when the Taliban came in, um, both groups were negotiating or trying to negotiate to get hold of this oil contract. And the US at that time uh, were particularly favourable towards the Taliban. They were, they were uh, most countries ignored the Taliban as being a legitimate group, but the US really encouraged them. And they actually took Taliban leaders and they took Al-Qaeda leaders to the US, to Virginia under Operation Cyclone, and they trained them militarily and they, um, and they uh, gave lavish money upon them to, to curry favour. Um, and so Carlos Bergeroni at that time uh, was, was, was quite uh, 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 challenging what was going on and we, can, we hear that some of Bin Laden at that stage was re talking to the Taliban and suggesting that they take the Argentinian um, consortium rather than <coughs> the US one and the US were not particularly interested about this and not very happy at all. And we hear that there were already plans as to how they thought they could get into the country. And once we've had uh, September 11, we know what happens with that. There's, uh, um, there's, uh, the Twin Towers are bombed, um, or hit by planes, and within a very short time, there's an announcement that it's Osama bin Laden, and he, in fact, Afghanistan has to be invaded um, to, because of the nasty Taliban. And it, that's a little bit strange, actually, because Osama bin Laden's not Afghan, um, he was Saudi. Um, and the 19 people that the US suggested were a part of this plan, 15 of them were Saudi. Um, the Taliban themselves had said, if you do, if, you, if Osama bin Laden is guilty here, we'll pass him over to you. But the US ignored that. Um, it was a time of um, when we were told that we're running out of oil. And, the, and it was George Bush who was, in, who was uh, president of the US and an oil man, his family of oil people. So there was a, definitely in, an interest in this oil uh, that was, we were told was running out. And uh, the US, once they, we, we had gone into the country and, uh, and invaded the country, uh, the US immediately put into, put into place the interim president at that time, Hamid Karzai. He was on the payroll of Unical. Uh, within, um, as soon as he was installed as, as uh, interim president, um, then uh, they, there was an oil envoy sent into the country. Um, his name, uh, Zome Kalazar. Um, he was, uh, well, he was the person who then reported back to Condoleezza Rice, Secretary of State, who was, had been working for Chevron. She was the Asian envoy for Chevron. Chevron had taken over Unical. Um, and we hear not much more about what was happening there. Um, the pipeline has been, has been agreed with the, with the Afghan government under Karzai, and it is being built, and it was August 25, 2008, that the TAPI agreement was signed. And this was uh, Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India. Uh, involved in setting up this pipeline. And it, it's also interesting 
that we were told um, you know, Osama bin Laden is what we're looking for. So we were told two things. The US said, we're going into Afghanistan because we have to find Osama bin Laden and we also have to liberate women. And you think, well, that's a little bit odd because under Bush, George Bush, Osama bin Laden was not to be found anywhere. Um, it was only under um, Obama that uh, he was actually located. We don't know his story because he was killed um, uh, in the process of finding him. Um, and we have to wonder um, what was happening because the American Geological Survey landed in Afghanistan before the Australian troops did. So as soon as, it, as the troops arrived in Afghanistan, within about a month or so, there was the American Geological Survey who were in the country. It was a four-year investigation and it cost $2 million and they were looking for oil and gas. And they put out a report um, after that four years saying that they were very excited because there was 18 times the amount of oil and three times the amount of gas that they actually had um, anticipated. So there's things happening in the background. So in the meantime, you know, ordinary Afghans are part of are the, the pawns in what's going on because there's other stuff that's happening around about. But it's not only oil and gas, unfortunately for Afghans, that um, is part of the country. Um, it's a very mineral rich country, so it's, a lot of businesses are very keen to get in there. And uh, I was hunting around on the web and came across this particular <coughs> article, which is from Money Morning, and it says, US geologists just found some one trillion of untapped mineral deposits in Afghanistan. Overnight, Afghanistan has gone from being a political prior to one of the richest countries on the globe. Afghanistan's mineral wealth includes large caches of iron, copper, gold and lithium that could turn the country into one of the most important mining centres in the world. So sign up to Money Morning and find out how to profit. So there's still uh, countries that have got their eye on, on what's in Afghanistan and, and China and India, which were not didn't spend any money in the invasion of the country, they were not part of it, have been active in getting in there to, to get to mineral wealth. India has already started mining oil um, in the north of Afghanistan. China has ex uh, rights to the world's second largest copper deposit. It's about 20 minutes out of Kabul. Um, it's on a, a very significant archaeological site which will probably be destroyed at where the, the, uh, the, the beginnings of Buddhism um, started. Um, and the Afghans don't have any uh, labour laws or environmental laws, so it, it's a country you can really get into and get your teeth into whatever's there without having to worry um, too much about it. Um, it's interesting, um, even when you, you can look around and you'll find um, people like Hillary Clinton who are talking about what was done in, the, in their, their time in Afghanistan. Um, I'll just read a little bit. This one was a, it was an interview on uh, CBS News, and this is it was back in 2009. So Hillary Clinton then was talking about what had been done in Afghanistan and the fact that it's ended up a basket case um, from the meddling, which has gone on for for such a long time. So troops left in 2014, but they're still there. I mean, we're told troops were moving out, but they're still. There's still action going on. People are still being uh, killed, um, and the country hasn't been put on its feet. Um, it's just been kept continually at war, and for us, that's really hard to understand because we we don't have that experience here. But I'm sure some of you probably have had experiences re with regard to active service and know that to, for that to be going on in the environment that you're living in um, since 1979. You know, it's nearly 35 years or so, it's hard to believe how anyone can survive at all. So, you know, Hillary Clinton's words were, the United States, to some extent, has to acknowledge being amongst the creators of the problem, uh, which is Afghanistan, uh, we are, are now dealing with. It seemed like a great idea back in the 1980s to embolden, train and equip Taliban, Mujahideen, jihadists against the Soviet Union, which had invaded Afghanistan. And with our help and with the Pakistani support, this group, including at that time Bin Laden, defeated the Soviet Union, drove them out of Afghanistan eventually, saw the fall of the government that they had installed, and the rest we know. 
They eventually took over, but when we accomplished our primary mission of seeing the Soviet Union thrown out of Afghanistan, we withdrew. And we left the problems of a well-equipped fundamentalist, ideological and religious group that had been battle-hardened. So that's Hillary speaking. So the, the last 15 years in particular, this is what's been going on. And, um, our troops have been over there as well, and it's, it's not a good experience for anybody. Um, again, this reason for going into Afghanistan you know, to, to, to invade the country, it's sort of like you know, if, if the Country Women's Association um, from, um, from New Zealand um, set themselves up here in Melbourne, and then one of their members did something in New Zealand, we hardly expect New Zealand to come and invade the country and to completely take over and rewrite the constitution and put in an interim president, prime minister. It just beggars belief. But for us, so it really, it, it has these political overtones as to what was going on. And our troops have suffered as well. You know, 40, when you're looking at this sort of situation, it's, you'd rather be sitting here having a cup of tea and with you, you fellows rather than what's happening here. And 41 of our troops were killed, um, but it's estimated that more than two and a half times uh, the number who were in Afghanistan in active service have committed suicide since they've come back. Um, Post-traumatic stress disorder is, is very bad. And so for, to try and put that again back into Afghan perspective, so it's, um, if our troops are finding it very difficult and they've been there a short time. How are Afghans actually finding this circumstance? So the country is, is continually um, in a state of violence. Um, and you can see you know, people live in these houses um, in these situations. And regularly, I, mean, I just heard um, that yesterday uh, a, a van had been blown up, 14 had been killed in the van. And, it's, and it happens regularly. And you might have heard um, recently, I don't know if any of you saw a foreign correspondent this week, or last week, I think it was, um, the Medicine Sans Frontieres Hospital in Kunduz was bombed. Um, and an Australian doctor who was working there um, had, has been speaking out and, and saying that this is actually a war crime. Actually, I'm, I don't know how you differentiate. I think war totally is a crime. I don't know how you work one bit from the other, but anyway. So there, it wasn't. It was patients and doctors. Um, my Afghan friend here, who was a doctor in Afghanistan, she said some of my former classmates were working there. They were killed. Um, so it, it, it happens all the time. Um, there were, there's a fellow, uh, a researcher at Monash Uni, who uh, runs a music school in Kabul itself. Um, he's, he's a fantastic fellow, and he educates through music, and he takes. Uh, orphans off the street and what they are able to, to achieve is incredible. You know, they're sitting playing, you know, shot band and what have you. And Emma Ayres, um, who was a, uh, an ABC breakfast journalist on uh, Radio National, and she was on, she is also a cellist. She's there at the moment as part of that school um, teaching the kids. But um, he, he, was, he was back there just recently and he was involved he, and a, a bomb went off and he had to come back here to Australia for surgery. But most Afghans can't come back to Australia for surgery and certainly the hospitals that they are attending are not, you know, what, and they're not the Alfred or, or St Vincent's, they're, they're definitely not at all. So uh, there's, there's often things happening, uh, um, there could be Bombs on the on the ground. There could be bombs dropped from above. You know, so that the one that was dropped on Kunduz Hospital was U.S. planes, and it can be uh, an aircraft dropping a plane, a bomb, or it can be drones as well. You know, drones have been used regularly, and where we've heard about the Medicine Sans Frontieres uh, situation, that's one which came to attention because it's an international organisation and well known. But uh, others uh, don't get uh, reported uh, so so uh, well. Um, for example, there was a wedding party um, 
and a, a bomb was dropped on that wedding party. They were supposedly a group of terrorists who were, who were meeting together. But after that, many were killed at that time and then people came the next morning to mourn and another bomb was dropped on them because they were regarded as terrorists. Many mistakes have been made. There's also been experimental armaments used in Afghanistan. The very beginning of bombing the Tora Bora area, the mountain area where um, supposedly Osama bin Laden was hiding. They used uh, depleted and non-depleted uranium warheads and the water in the area has been contaminated. There was a Canadian uh, research group went in and found that the, the radiation content was uh, really quite extraordinary where these had been dropped. Um, also, uh, in, in what has happened of giving money and armaments to these local leaders, we now have local leaders who are extremely powerful. So they have their own military, their own police, they own their own prisons, they kidnap, they have roadblocks, they extort, they murder, you name it. And so if you're moving from one part of the country to the other, you, you're going to come across one of these checkpoints. And for Zaras who live in the north part of Afghanistan, around in Mazar Sharif, I don't know if you might have seen that, again, a foreign correspondent um, a program was fairly recently. Um, and they were saying, we really are stuck here because here's our checkpoint, but we have to now go through a Taliban checkpoint if we want to come down south to the capital, Kabul. And the chances, we don't know what happens if we go through that checkpoint. We might well be killed. Um, so th this is happening regularly. We, we have uh, my friend Gula, who, the doctor who went back to, to Kabul um, last year after being away for, for more than 20 years. And we were trying to connect with women in the West who we wanted to set up a project with. She couldn't connect with them. Um, and, and local people said, don't even try. You know, you'll, you'll be dead. Don't, don't even think about it. And the death toll has increased. Um, so you can see um, the blue graph that you can see is is number of deaths that have happened over time and the red is the uh, is injuries and uh, the amount of injuries since records have been taken has increased every year and i think uh, from 2014 to 15 uh, the figures um, went up uh, something like about 19 percent of, of, of deaths uh, increase and 30 percent of injuries over the year before so even though we've said things are all okay in Afghanistan, we're moving on, the actual trauma in the country has, has gone up, has risen and is still rising. The girl down here um, ha has one arm missing. Um, but it's common for um, one in eight families will have somebody who's stepped on an eye, a, a, a landmine that's been set up um, and has a, a limb missing. Um, it happens regularly. And um, it's actually... The Taliban are particularly good at, at, at bomb making because they were uh, trained by um, MI6 and SAS, um, the British, um, in how to do it. So they're very good at it. Um, but unfortunately, destruction is the end product. Now this, the aid money that's gone into Afghanistan is, uh, has really been directed um, mainly towards armament, to the, to the, the fighting that's going on and also uh, to giving money to these local uh, warlords. And this picture, the building at the back belongs to a local warlord. So he's become very rich over this period of time. And there's many Westerners who also become very rich. Um, uh, security people were being paid $1,000 a day. And you might have heard of the, the company uh, 4GS, which is, uh, has been in the news of late, uh, with Omar, uh, uh, the, the fellow who, who, who was the Orlando uh, killer, Omar Martin, um, he worked for that. And this is a very large company. It's the third largest employment uh, company in the world with 600,000 employees um, involved in security. They were Blackwater uh, originally and they have a fairly notorious history um, of what goes on. Um, but they, they are making a lot of money out of it and we certainly have put a lot of money into into some of the less desirable characters. And Matabullah Khan is the fellow who the Australians were working with um, in uh, Oriskan province. Um, or other Afghans said, this guy is a criminal. Don't even consider it. The Dutch wouldn't work with him, but the Australians were. And he 
had his own military, his own, and we trained military and police and gave it in, under his control, so he really benefited a great deal. He's since been murdered, I might add, so somebody else is looking um, to take over his power base. Um, because of the internal situation, continually there's internal stuff happening, people fighting. Um, a number flew to where they think it's the safest, this is Kabul, and it's a, a, where they gather themselves um, in, in very um, poor conditions in tents. Um, and again, one of our Afghan friends went back, went and spoke to some of these people, and she was horrified when she saw that girls like this little girl were being taken off for uh, prostitution. So the, the, the country is now, it's extremely poor, it's insecure, conservative, and you certainly don't have a great deal of cultural progression uh, when you, you're just trying to survive. Um, but again, like you can see, the fellow in the front, he's, he's well equipped, um, he's been given quite a bit of money for his, his uh, uniform, what have you, and this little girl is very timidly looking out of her house. Uh, just wondering what he's on about, and she certainly doesn't seem to have had the same benefit. I might add too that our aid to Afghanistan has been cut back, um, and Julie Bishop had made the comment that we will give foreign aid in uh, um, what we get out of it, which I find absolutely disgraceful. Um, you know, we, what we can get out of giving this aid to these people. And I think it was Save the Children, then we've had a, a program um, in Kabul, it's been going for about 10 years and that's been cut, but there's many others. So here, here we are, this is, you know, uh, things are not really booming along here. Like on the way down here, I noticed many places which have been felled and there's a huge house being built in, the, in its place. It's not happening in Afghanistan, that's where you might be living. Most live in the rural areas too, I might add, so this is the circumstance. So there we are, that's a house that's uh, maybe going to be a candidate for the block. And again, there's no centralised post office, there's no centralised uh, water system or electricity. Uh, things are, are very um, well behind uh, what we would expect. And so many, particularly in the rural areas, have to spend a lot of time collecting, going and finding water. And they've had a drought period similar to what we've had, so that, that 10 years has been particularly difficult. And the UN will, uh, has made it quite clear that if, to be born a girl and it's in Afghanistan is really one of the, the most uh, traumatic things that can happen to any, any girl. And often a girl uh, will be married off uh, very early. 60% uh, of them will be married off before 16. And they'll go from their own home to another place, um, probably never see their family again. Uh, they might be one of several wives or just one and they'll give birth quickly. So we know that, that, that uh, girls giving birth early has traumatic effects. Uh, you can end up with, with a fistula problem so that, you, that, that the child is not uh, grown enough to be able to, to, concert, to, to give birth without being damaged. And she probably will be the one who looks after children um, if there are already any, and she's the lowest in the pecking order. And she's likely to be married to someone much older than her. And she can be, she can be married off as a debt. Um, and if you're really poor and you've borrowed money for a crop and it doesn't come to anything, and the, the, the person who you, you got the money from wants it back, then you can offer a daughter, which is just horrendous. Again, another foreign correspondent program had, had uh, a, a situation on this where the farmer was saying, I've got to give my daughter. To, uh, to the person I borrowed the money from. It was he had an opium, opium crop and that was felled by, by uh, those who were trying to eradicate um, uh, opium. And uh, I don't know how that um, reporter just could, could walk away from that. And uh, bad, it's a bad, it's very bad, um, that if there's a problem, uh, one, fam one person offends somebody else, the, the consequences are always put back onto the girl. So um, this, the one up at the top there, this here, 
Um, La Bibi, she, her cousin was, was wanting to marry somebody in another village and he was harassing them. That group came back and captured her and they, they were police, took them to the, her to the police office, they raped her and chained her up for many days. Um, she was punished for what her cousin, her male cousin was doing. Fortunately, uh, she was a, a, a goat herd's daughter. She, her parents supported her, her father and her mother. They went to Kabul and spoke to Hamid Karzai and there was a lot of international pressure and those who did it were actually convicted. So um, that was a, a very good uh, outcome. The girl at the bottom, um, her nose was, was taken off and she since has had reconstructive surgery. And for adultery, and adultery can be anything, like you can be accused of adultery for doing nothing, for walking down the street and there happens to be a fellow who goes past um, and there's been many cases of the, the girl being executed, being shot or stoned to death. Um, and uh, if, if there's rape involved, um, by the girl um, saying that she'd been raped, she can end up in prison and this is what happened to this uh, Gulnaz, this young woman. That's the child of the rape. Uh, again, there was international... She was uh, told that uh, if, he, if she married the rapist, then that would be okay. And she actually has married the rapist um, because of the social pressure that against her. Even though there was quite a lot of um, international uh, uh, condemnation of what was happening. And again, for those who are accused of, of adultery, they can be put in prison and many of them prefer to be in there because it's, it's actually safer for them to be there. This is, is uh, uh, um, a number of prisons, women's prisons. This one's in Mazar Sharif in the north. And for, for many girls, an uh, alarming number who've been, who have been married off and they're uh, suffering extreme violence in this relationship. Um, there's been a large number who've set themselves on fire to try and commit suicide and often they don't actually succeed and with very dire consequences. Um, education has been limited. Uh, there certainly has been more since uh, the invasion of the country. Um, but uh, still, schools are attacked by, by extremists and have to close down. There's been a large number in the last year. And mostly the education will be like there's two up on the left hand, these two here. Their education is about finding out how to collect water rather than going to school. Many widows, every time a, a male is killed in the fighting, a widow is created. She then has no breadwinner, she might be completely illiterate, many of them are, um, and she has no social security or legacy or ministry of housing or Medicare. She is really in dire straits. Um, and for work choices, begging is, a, um, is an option. And uh, again, a friend that went back recently was quite alarmed to find many um, in Kabul this way. Kids who've been uh, covered in blood bandages and obviously doped out on opium. Health problems, um, very difficult for women to, to get access to health. And this, this um, woman here doesn't look particularly well and often she'll use opium um, to relieve pain and the child can end up with a problem. So this is it. Many are opium addicted, um, heroin addicted, men and women. So this is what was starting when we were uh, in Afghanistan. This was in the 1970s. This, when I mentioned about the king and queen being moderate, there were women in Kabul looking like this, just like we look like here. So things were be moving along progressively. Um, these are all women who've been killed uh, working in public places or, uh, or working for women, um, like this one here. Uh, um, uh, Malala Kanka, she was a senior policewoman, similar to perhaps Chris, Christine Nixon. Um, this one here. Um, uh, who was working down in Kandahar. She was the uh, um, um, women's officer down there and maybe similar to something like um, Tanya Plibersik, but women who, who have all been murdered just for doing the work that they do. But there has been an increase in schooling um, and they're very eager um, to be educated, number one. And like this one here, it says, we all want independence. So, doing a bit of um, political statement at the same time. 
There are now girls who are studying at university. Certainly during the period that the Russians were in the country, um, it was uh, expected that women were equal in the community. Something like about 70% of teachers were women and about 40% of doctors were women. And that's why my friends here who were trained at that time are part of that. But, uh, but it's certainly they're back in universities, but it, it, they risk their life going. They're likely to be murdered for just being at the university and certainly being anywhere near males. And skills training um, has, has, there has been a certain amount of it, but certainly not enough. And uh, some parts of this one of uh, Women's Garden, they've, they've set up an enclosed area with security guards so that they can meet and just relax rather than be in public, um, a public area without being killed. And um, I like this one. So this woman's no burger. Um, she's, she's driving. And I like the, the look of the fellow in the next car. He's quite alarmed to see for her. And she's, <laughs> Afghan women are very feisty. Um, and then they don't want to put up with what's going on. So there's been women in the media um, who, again, risk their life um, by being part of this public life. Um, these are police trains, so that the, they're looking very serious, the women in the front row. Um, they're taking their job very seriously and they're prepared to do it knowing that they could be killed. Um, this one, she's a fighter pilot. Um, again, very skilled people. Given a bit of education and a leg up and they're off and running. And a graffiti artist. Um, this is in Bamiyan, so um, again, that foreign correspondent program um, showed these, these girls who are training for the Olympics. Um, so there's a number of them, um, athletes as well, who, who have been training and will be participating in the Olympic Games. And, but it's a, they're very keen to, to they, they see what's happening internationally. They have um, mobile phones, internet, uh, television, and so they know what's going on in other countries and they want to be part of it. Demonstrations for their equality. Uh, this one, Farkunda, a uh, woman who was murdered by uh, somebody at the mosque when she, when she accused somebody of selling fake charms. Um, it was a, a, a very traumatic, I won't even explain what happened. It's too traumatic. But men, men particularly young people, uh, two-thirds of the country are under 35. So young people are definitely wanting a change and they want equality for men and women. And boys, men, have been equally act, uh, active in, 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 talk, in, in uh, discussing this. Um, uh, a friend's son, he's a journalist that works uh, out of Prague, and all his writing is about equality for women in Afghanistan. So it's not just women who are asking for this change. Men are, young, young men are certainly part of it. And those who are causing the problem are these older, um, probably psychologically damaged, many of them, uh, men and uneducated men. Internet cafes, so schools training on the internet. It's a women's one. And this bit one group um, will make the change. So the hope is for a better future. And this is us. So we, we went to India and we trained with an amazing Indian organisation that, that uh, supports 1.3 million women in small projects uh, in, in self-reliance work. Um, and we, we took Afghans with us. Um, so they were trained, and uh, whoops. And we hope to set up a project that we're working in, in collaboration with uh, SAWA, the Self-Employed Women's Association, which came out of the Textile Women, the Textile Workers Union with Gandhi. Um, and we're setting up a schools uh, and uh, business um, project in Kabul. And I've gone well over time. I can keep going till anyone got anything on this afternoon. I can keep going. <laughs> You might have a question of yes. half a question, probably. Yeah. And absolutely fascinating presentation. Thank you very much indeed. A simple question, probably too difficult to answer too quickly. Is it getting better, or is it getting worse, or is it the same? Well, it's, the positive is that uh, the younger people are demanding change and are bringing about change. Um, so there's, there's that light at the end of the tunnel. And they're really demanding that they want a different future. 
On the band side, there's still these elements, um, which are the, the uh, well-armed, um, many of them are nutters, to be honest, who are causing destruction. Um, uh, so we've got our fingers crossed. Thank you. Thank you. Should I have kept him alive? <laughs> well, it would be interesting for him to say what was going on. And so even with this fellow in Orlando, um, like if you, and it was mentioned before, if you've been in a war situation for 35 years, there's many who are psychologically very badly damaged. And he also, there's something was going on there. And, it's, and with, with Osama bin Laden, again, it would be good to learn more. We, we don't seem to learn about what happens because we just kill them. But we need to know more about what's going on so we can actually try and intercept things happening in the future. We just kill somebody when we don't have the knowledge as how we can avoid it next time. The ordinary European uh, in your organisation going to those places, they're taking a significant risk. Yes, very much. That um, when my friend Gore went back and, and we were saying, you know, oh, you can come back as well. And I'm thinking, well, it's, it's not going to work because uh, even the fact that Westerners with her, it's fairly obvious that there's, you know, I could be kidnapped or she could be kidnapped because we're going to be wealthy or we can, we, we can be killed. So there was no real advantage in, in us going there. But it, it, um, it, it, it's certainly very risky. And you, Kabul itself, the capital city, is about where you're probably the safest. But the road from the airport into the city is very dangerous. Thanks for your uh, presentation. We, although it's heartbreaking, um, I wonder, in relation to the Australian situation where we agonise over destruction of Aboriginal culture, who takes responsibility when Afghani culture, as it stands and has been for thousands of years, is wiped out? Well, exactly. Well, I guess like the, the fellow from Monash Uni would be one of those who's trying to make sure it doesn't because his, his music uh, school is part of that. And uh, they, are very, they have a very rich history of poetry and music, which is still there. Um, and they're trying to develop it. So um, again, with younger people, hopefully this will, uh, and, and if there is a change for the better, that it can be restored, hopefully. Yes. Of the 200 girls that were snatched from school, you hear, I think, about seven or eight escapes somehow over a period of time. It must be two years ago. Yeah, that's not true. The Western world gets somebody in there to clear that crap up, excuse me, to yeah, exactly. There, there does need to be more support of, of, of that case. That, that's Nigeria, but, but in Afghanistan, two women are trafficked as well, and there are, uh, so we need to, 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 to work on it. Just one last question. Okay. Off the back, yes. Saudi Arabia and the Taliban, this is connection with a big one. Yes. What could be done about that? Well, it's interesting. Like Hillary Clinton has recently been talking about Saudi Arabia, and up to the, particularly under the Bush regime, Saudi Arabia was ignored, and a lot of what's come out into uh, other countries, you know, Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, has come from Saudi Arabia. The Wahhabi sect is the, really where Al Qaeda came, has come out of, and Taliban has come out of. So they have, uh, you know, large. They are a big problem, and but they're not challenged because they're oil. But now the US is less reliant now on, on Saudi oil and it's interesting that Hillary Clinton has made even just recent comments saying Saudi Arabia is a problem, we have to, we have to look at this. But they, they're, they're the hidden part as well which, which hasn't been talked about but they're very significant in causing a lot of these problems that are, that are happening, particularly with these extremist fundamentalist groups. That's where they're coming from. Uh, I, I'd just like to say it's an incredible story and uh, a lot of 
facts that have come out that we wouldn't know when we're reading the normal press. I think it's amazing, on him that you uh, you start out in the 70s with a sense of adventure, but now it's just sheer courage. Um, yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it's just uh, quite remarkable and uh, very elucidating what you said here. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, absolutely beautiful. Thank you very much. But I'll, I'll also do something which is, I think um, uh, Jeff's going to take me by the arm and quickly run me up through the door. But um, I know that it's not protocol for Provis um, to, to make donations, but I do have a Purple box on the mantelpiece there, and if anyone wants to force donations upon me, I'm very happy to accept it. It all goes directly into our project and can make a difference, so I'm quite willing to accept it. Thank you very much.